So I thought it was worth doing one um, additional, more complicated sort of setup example of rotational and translational motion. Um, this is certainly not a problem that we're going to walk all the way through so much as just sort of think it, think through the setup. So the, the situation I want to think about is a skidding car. Um, so I'm going to look at the car from the top down. So this is a car from the top down, really. Um, and the car has sort of tires at the four corners. And what I'm imagining is that I'm interested in figuring out how the car skids. Um, so let's sort of define that a little bit more carefully. When I say how the car skids, I'm going to imagine that someone has slammed the brakes on and that all four tires are locked. And so the whole car is just sliding across some surface and potentially rotating as it slides across the surface. And um, obviously, if you start to spin the tires, that some of the things about this are going to change, and I'm not going to talk about that, which ends up being slow, somewhat more complicated, although certainly tractable. So if we actually think about what's going to happen with that, um, you know, in a car, there's some you know, center of mass, and that center of mass is going to be moving. And then the car might be rotating in some way around that center of mass. And as the car rotates and moves, there are going to be frictional forces on the different tires. And those frictional forces will be in different directions depending on how each individual tire is moving relative to the ground. Okay. So there are actually quite a few forces acting. And saying exactly how this system is going to act initially is, is a little bit hard to do. Clearly, you can draw um, some keyframes for this and think through what might happen. But other than the observation that there are going to be these frictional forces that are going to tend to cause the car both to rotate and to, um, and to slow down, it, it, I'm not sure you can say a whole lot more than that. Um, so given that um, sort of general abstraction, what I want to do is think about how do I actually represent this from a coordinate perspective? And then how do I think about modeling the forces and torques that involved? Well, from a coordinate perspective, I think this is another case where it makes a lot of sense to simply say there is a position of the center of mass, right? And the car is located at some angle um, relative to horizontal. So like as, we, as with the caber toss, I think you can actually use a very similar um, coordinate system here. That means that ultimately I'm going to need three second-order differential equations. I want to know what x double dot is, what y double dot is, where x dot and y, x, x and y are the positions at the center of mass, and then I'll also want to know theta double dot. Okay. Um, so that's our sort of objective here, and I'm not going to get all the way to that objective, but hopefully I'll at least convince you what the steps are in getting to that objective. Um, we need to abstract this graphically, so let's draw a free body diagram for it. So here is the car. Right? There are four points, which I'll call one, two, three, and four, where the wheels contact the ground. And then there also is the center of mass, which is located somewhere towards the front or to the, towards the back, depending on the situation. If I think about this from a forces perspective, assuming that I'm confining myself just to the xy plane, there actually are only frictional forces acting, right? Gravity is acting down, but the normal forces are all acting up. They're offsetting each other. So really, the only forces that are going to matter are friction. But the direction of the frictional forces is actually going to be different for each of the different tires. For example, let's assume that the car is just doing donuts, right? It's just spinning around. Well, if it's just spinning around, and it's spinning around its center of mass, um, pretty clearly um, this tire is going to be moving in this direction, and so there'll be a frictional force on that tire that's sort of like that. This tire is going to be moving more sort of down, and so there'll be a frictional force sort of like that. This tire is, there'll be a frictional force like that. This tire, there'll be a frictional force like that, right? If, on the other hand, the car were skidding forward, right, when it's skidding forward, there actually is going to be a frictional force backwards on each of the four tires. So the direction of the frictional forces are going to be different depending on what the motion of the car is. Okay. But regardless, there are only four frictional forces. And so let's label those on this version of the free body diagram. So I'll call this F1, F2, F3, and finally F4.
Okay? Um, I also need to know where those forces are being applied. Um, pretty clearly, each of them has a relevant vector associated with it, so I'm going to call this R1, this R2, this R3, and this R4. Okay. So now we can start to think about what are the forces, how do we actually write mathematical expressions for these forces, and how do we think about the torques, and how do we think about the angular momentum. Well, the forces, um, first of all, I don't know exactly what they're going to be in size. I'm going to have to make some kinds of assumptions. Here's the assumption I'm going to make. I'm going to assume that each of the four tires is bearing equal weight. Not a great assumption, but it's a, an assumption I could make and at least know that it's in the right ballpark. Pretty clearly in reality, this car will do, you know, will sort of lean one way or the other, and there'll be a lot more weight on one tire than the other. It's a much more complicated dynamics problem. So for this first iteration of the model, I'm going to assume all four tires are bearing equal weight. In that case, the magnitude of these frictional forces is simply going to be a kinetic frictional force times the mass of the car times gravity divided by four. Right? The directions of the frictional forces, though, are all going to be different. Right? The directions of the frictional forces actually are going to depend on what the relative, what the velocities are of each of these points. Right? So I'm going to say this is F1 is going to be minus mu k times m times g over 4 in the v1 hat direction, where v1 is the velocity of tire number 1 relative to the ground. Right? So if tire number 1 is moving across the ground in this direction, the frictional force is opposite that. Right? If tire number 1 moving across the ground upwards, the frictional force would resist that. Okay? Um, which means that if I actually try to write out V1 in some detail, V1 is actually going to be the velocity at the center of mass, right, plus um, whatever this distance is, so let's call that D, D1 times um, theta dot times theta 1 hat, right? And I'm going to define here, this direction is r1 hat, this direction is theta 1 hat, this direction is r4 hat, and this direction is theta 4 hat, right? So to the extent that the position is d1 in the r1 hat direction, the velocity is going to be d1 times theta, theta dot in the theta 1 hat direction, right? So with that definition in mind, right, this velocity is the velocity of that tire relative to the ground. So I can meaningfully write out F1 right, and F2 etc. Right? Um, so I know what the forces are at this point. That means I can find the torques. And for finding the torques, probably I'm going to want to choose to find torques about the center of mass. So the torque about the center of mass for object number for tire number one is going to be simply d1 times r1 hat cross um, v1 vector or d1 r1 hat cross rcom dot plus d1 theta dot theta 1 hat. Right. Notice that even though I'm choosing the center of mass as my origin, I still need to think about this, um, uh, sorry, it should be f1. Oh, I crap, screwed this up. Let me... So, the, sorry, the torque will be d1 times r1 hat cross f1 vector, or d1 r1 hat cross minus mu k mg over 4 v1 hat. But v1 hat, notice, depends both on what the velocity of the center of mass is and on what the velocity relative to the center of mass is. And that's an important sort of distinction here. Even though I've chosen the center of mass as my origin for calculating the torque, I still need to know 
what the velocity of the tire is relative to the ground in order to figure out what the direction of this frictional force is. Okay. So at this point, um, if you actually look at this, you can see, first of all, that I can write v1 hat in terms of what x dot, y dot, and theta dot are. Right? Um, I can write the torque in terms of what x dot, y dot, theta dot are. Um, and I actually can figure out what all the forces are. So I'm, re I'm ready to actually go ahead and write my equations of motion. I've got my torques, I've got my forces. So my equations of motion conceptually are fairly easy to write in this case. The summation of the forces tells me what the time rate of change of the momentum of the center of, ma about the, of, the center of mass is. The summation of the forces here is simply F1 plus F2 plus F3 plus F4, which looks pretty simple until you start to write all the V1 hats and V2 hats and V3 hats and V4 hats in here. Um, and similarly on the right hand side, this is simply M times X double dot I hat plus Y double dot J hat. Right? So that's a fairly straightforward equation to write in terms of what the state variables are. And by the same token, the sum of torques, right? These torques are all taken about the center of mass, right? So we do need to think about, we're, we're only thinking about rotation about the center of mass. And so that similarly is going to be fairly simple to write the moment of inertia for, or what to write the angular momentum for. The angular momentum will be I center mass times theta dot. So this will simply be I center mass times theta double dot in the k hat direction, right? So this is time rate of change of the angular momentum about the center of mass. And this is the torque. So in principle, this is not a terribly complicated problem to set up. In practice, um, what ends up being hard is simply just keeping track of all of these different unit vectors. Um, but if you can actually use the sort of vector tools that we've been developing, this kind of problem, although it looks challenging in the end, is not terribly bad to set up and simulate. Having said that, setting it up and then doing anything meaningful analytically with it would be a complete bear.